there, Steve Kaufman here. Today I'm going to talk to you about how to become fluent in Mandarin in six months. Let me begin by saying that you can't do that. However, uh, it's a goal. Uh, I think one can become quite fluent in six, quite comfortable in six months. And, and first of all, let me explain why I'm going to talk about that because I received an email from one of my viewers here. And he said, I am a current student of Mandarin Chinese, blah, 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 live in Beijing. I have a goal to become professionally and socially competent in Chinese as quickly and as efficiently as possible. My time frame, six months to one year. Uh, I agree that the classroom is not the best place to learn a new language, although I plan to use it as a door into the world of Chinese. Good idea. Uh, people such as Tim Ferriss talk about the Pareto's 80-20 principle which I don't think applies to language learning, but I'll explain why. And I have spoken, he says, you have spoken about material over method. Well, maybe talk about that. But he says, in the interest of discovering what can work best for language learning, I'd like to take advantage of your extensive expertise. If you, if you flatter me, I'll always uh, accommodate you. Um, in your pursuit of Chinese fluency, what will you say were the most effective exercises or methods you used? For example, speaking with a native one-on-one, -on -one, reading Chinese novels, comics. Two, what sort of helpful exposure to the Chinese language did you have that others may not have thought of or incurred? Three, what is the biggest waste of time? Four, if I had to teach myself, what books or materials would you recommend? And next, if you had to train me intensively, how would you drill me? So this is the thing. Okay, fluent in six months. Okay. Uh, where I come unstuck with this idea of fluent three months, six months, nine months, 12 months is the assumption is that you're going to do something in six months that, that then it's, you've finished it, you've completed it, you've now done it. Language learning is not like that. Uh, what you want to achieve in six months or nine months is this language potential that is going to enable you to improve a lot as you continue to use the language. You, because uh, in all the languages that I speak, I am better now than I ever have been. Bear in mind, if I leave a language, like right now I'm trying to study Italian and I last night I, I was at a party with some Brazilians and for the first 10, 15 minutes I was falling all over myself speaking Italian rather than Portuguese. But towards the end of the evening, I got better. And that's only in one evening. And I think that if I were in Brazil for a couple of days, my Portuguese would get better than it ever has been. My Mandarin Chinese is better today than it was when I finished my 10 months of intensive training, even though at that time I could write longhand. I can't do that now. What I'm trying to say is that any language is a lifelong journey. All you can do in a period of three, six, nine months is get yourself up to that level so that you can now engage people in more or less intelligent conversations. You can start to read things that are more or less interesting. Uh, and then you will just continue to improve. And the more you use the language, the better you will get. And it's like a snowball. The more you have, the more you can engage in meaningful conversations, the more interesting material you can use and so forth and so on. So with that in mind, I think the goal is to get comfortable so that you can comfortably interact with people in meaningful situations, comfortably access authentic material, even though you're going to stumble. But it's comfortable because you don't worry about stumbling and you know that it's a long road. So with that in mind, here's what I would recommend for Mandarin Chinese, if the sky's the limit. Or for that matter, for me, if I were taking a new language, say Turkish, go to the place where the language is spoken. Go there right away. If nothing else matters, money doesn't matter, just go there. I have often said you're better off to wait until you have some exposure to the language before going if you want to basically optimize the opportunity, you know, maximize the return on investment. But if you're not worried about a return on investment, go there because you'll be surrounded by the language. It's a constant incentive to learn the language. You have every time you learn something, you might notice it on a shop window or you hear it on the radio and all of this stimulates you to keep going. So that's number one. Well, our friend here has written me the email. He's already in Beijing. So that's good. The second thing is if I remember 
and this is specific to Mandarin. My first month with Mandarin, we had a thing called Chinese Dialogues. It was spoken, I thought, so quickly that I thought they were doing it deliberately to annoy us. It was so annoyingly fast. And we only had Pinyin, or in those days, Wade Giles, which is a different system of using, uh, you know, the Latin alphabet, Roman alphabet to describe Chinese. So we read it phonetically and we listened to it. And I listened to it over and over and over again. And I, I was so annoyed by how fast they seemed to speak. But I think that was very good for me. And, you know, I've often thought about should you begin by learning the characters or not and so forth. I think in the case of Chinese, where we're dealing with tones and all these other things, I look back on it now, probably not a bad idea. Because then when you start learning the characters, you're learning the characters for words you have already heard and maybe know and know the meaning of. And the vocabulary in these initial dialogues is pretty basic. And so as you start learning the characters, anytime you can learn something, uh, try to study something that you already have a point of reference for, you're going to learn it better. You're going to be more curious. Uh, I always quote the famous Sufi saying, you can only learn what you already know. It's a slight overstatement. But that's why I always say with grammar, once you have enough you know, input and, and experience with the language, the grammar rules start to make sense. You actually want to learn them because you've come across these structures in your listening and reading. So with Mandarin, first thing is, first month, just listen to these simple dialogues many times. And if they're too fast for you, that's probably good. And I would suggest maybe laying off the characters for the first month. That's number one. Number two, once you start the characters, you have to have a program. I started with 10 a day and I got it up to 30 a day. Granted, you're going to forget most of them, but you have to relearn them and relearn them. And I've described in, on many occasions how I use this, uh, you know, checkered paper and wrote them out longhand and put the meaning over three columns and then soon would run into that again and keep on doing that. And I would do, I started out at 10, I got it up to 30. And so I think that kind, some kind of a spaced repetition system like that, characters, you got to spend an hour a day and you have to do it every day, every day. So if this person is in Beijing, he's got all the time in the world, wants to learn Chinese, an hour a day on characters, because that's your major stumbling block. Until you have the characters, you can't read. And I believe that reading is very important to acquiring vocabulary. Then the next thing is what were the most effective exercise? The most effective thing to do is to listen and read. In my opinion, uh, I, you know, if I went to Turkey, you know, you talk about this one-on-one -on -one with a native. Yes. After three months, but not initially because I don't know enough of the language and I find it kind of, uh, I don't like being put in the position where a teacher is drilling me. I just don't like doing that. I'd rather discover the language on my own. And when I'm able to defend myself and understand what the teacher is saying, then we can actually get into a conversation. So in the meantime, just that massive exposure and as hard as you can go at it. And if you're full time, of course, you can vary things. So you can work on your characters. You can work on your listening and reading. I mean, you want to keep your incentive up by all means, have a one-on-one -on -one session, but don't sit in a classroom listening to other non-native speakers mangle the language. I would never, never do that. Um, helpful exposure that others may not have had. No, I mean, we, the, the main thing was that I went to bookstores all the time in Hong Kong and I looked for, there was a geography book at 300 characters. There was a history book at 600 characters. There was, I was constantly scouring bookstores for readers with glossaries and that were graded for character level. And so I think that's important. Biggest waste of time is looking up a conventional dictionary because it's so time consuming in the case of Chinese. And you have to assume that whatever you look up in a dictionary, you're going to forget. You're going to forget it as soon as you close the dictionary, half the time. You'll go right back to the context and you'll forget what it was you saw in the dictionary, unless you're a lot better than I am. And, and I think a lot of people have the same experience. It's just too difficult. Again, you don't have enough things to tie it to. Uh, so if I had to teach myself what books are materials, you have to go out and search for materials. Uh, no one's going to give it to you. You have to go and now you can 
I mean, everything is so much better now than when I was doing Chinese. You can look for material on the internet. Of course, you can go to bookstores. You don't have to use traditional lookup dictionaries. You can have online dictionaries. You can use link. So you stay in the context. So you don't go off and look something up, close the dictionary, come back. Ooh, what was that? Uh, so, you, you know, uh, use whatever you can find, constantly be looking for new stuff and just keep on feeding it into you. That's what I did. Uh, another thing is I would start to write as soon as I can. Now here again, there are things that you can do that I couldn't do. For example, you can write and then very quickly on Google Translate, see how far off you were. Because your thoughts are gonna start in English, you write something out in Chinese, your struggle, whatever, then go to Google Translate, type it in, or if you have a Mac, you can use the dictation and you can actually speak it and up pops the Japanese. So you can actually be practicing your writing. Or if you're at link, you can write something, put it on the exchange, somebody will come along and correct it for you. Uh, if you had to train me intensively for a month, what would the program look like? Well, it wouldn't be very different from what I'm saying now. Uh, I wouldn't drill you. I wouldn't drill you. I would tell you to go away, fill your brain with Chinese, listening to it, reading it, learn characters, and when you're ready, come back and we're gonna start talking. And when we talk, I'm going to make notes of your mistakes and you're going to get a list of those mistakes to take away and study. I'll try not to interrupt you when we're speaking, uh, which is essentially, again, what we do in our online conversations at Link, where we send these reports through that people study. So uh, there you have it. Uh, that's for Chinese. And I think after six months, oh, two quick things here. Tim Ferriss talks about the 80-20 principle, you know, and I presume this refers to learn the you know, the 20% the, uh, of the words are use, give you 80% of the content. I have never found that to be such a useful concept. The 80%, in other words, the 20% of words that account for 80% of the context of any conversation, you're going to come across them naturally anyway. However, to get into meaningful conversations, to understand what people are saying, you will find that you need a lot of words. That's been my experience. The most frequent 80% will take care of themselves. Don't worry about it. You have to worry about how to stay motivated so that you can learn the many, many words that you need to engage in meaningful conversation with people, you know, intelligent conversation, to read books, to read the newspaper, to read magazines, to understand movies. You need a lot of words. So the 80-20 doesn't apply. Um, then he said that I spoke of material over method. I'm not quite sure what that means, but as I've said many times, motivation, initiative, time with the language, developing that ability to notice. And there's again where a teacher can help you because there are certain things that you just won't notice and the teacher can point them out. Uh, and so the, the method really to me is a lot of exposure and then starting to speak. And when you start speaking, you just keep going. Uh, and don't worry. Don't worry like is this his third tone or the second tone. Just speak. Just speak. Uh, so that's, so I think you can achieve a lot in six months and if it's a European language, even three months, you can get to that threshold level. You know, I sometimes have talked about this upside down hockey stick where the first three months or so is very difficult, but you are aware of making progress because a previously unintelligible language is now intelligible. But then there is that long period and that's why I say don't think in terms of what you, you're going to master it in six months you're not you're going to get yourself up to a level and then you've got a long road and uh, if you're uh, in china there uh, you're probably young uh, you're not going to learn chinese and forget it you're going to have chinese with you for your whole life and it will continue getting better or it should if you develop habits of reading and listening and so forth and so on before i leave you i just want to say that uh, again i've gone up bit long here but I was up in Whistler at a lumber industry conference and on my way up there and back I was listening to Italian so I'm going to leave as a little trailer here uh, driving down with uh, how sound on my right and I'm listening to I Promessi Sposi and he's describing the Lago di Como and of course the fjord uh, how sound is a bit reminiscent of Lago di Como and so it's just this whole idea of how reading and listening can take you off into different centuries different countries, different languages, and uh, it's a constant source of enjoyment with the language. And I might enjoy uh, listening to an Italian audiobook 20 years from now, uh, as I did when I listened 20 years ago. So your languages are always with you. 
Thank you for listening. Bye for now.